Welcome to Horteras Presents, a brand agnostic interview podcast that seeks to objectively highlight the happenings within the world of diagnostics. And now, your hosts, Rich Thayer and Mickey Yade. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Hal Terrace Presents. My name is Rich Thayer, Managing Partner at Hal Terrace Associates. And this is Mickey Yurde, the Founding Partner at Hal Terrace Associates. In this solo episode, Mickey and I are going to discuss recent advancements in the wearables technology space. Wearables technologies are a rapidly growing segment in medical technologies with exciting new capabilities on the horizon. We hope you enjoyed this episode on advancements in wearables technologies. With traditional approaches to medicine, the patient-medical system interaction generally begins with the presentation of some sort of symptoms or feeling that something is just not right. This approach has been referred to as sick care rather than health care. With recent advancements in wearables technologies, there's the opportunity to monitor a plethora of physiological and disease metrics periodically or even continuously thereby moving the continuum of care much closer to the individual or patient and much closer to true personalized health care. What is driving this increased interest in wearables? Well, aside from the large and significant movement toward the consumerism of health care and wellness approaches, there have been significant advances in microfluidics and manufacturing, improved microelectronics, including novel power solutions and capabilities in data transmission, detection technologies, including electrical chemical sensors, improved biomarkers and biofluid collection capabilities, such as non-invasive collection of sweat, and use of smartphone apps and AI-driven algorithms that together help to enrich the data stream and actionability of these results. Great introduction, Rich. Uh, you know, let's start with a brief recap of some of the emerging technology and capabilities uh, that I think we both think are certain to drive significant change in the segment. One of the traditional challenges with these technologies is that the small size, low cost, and ease of use form factors has, has made it quite difficult to deliver the level of sensitivity, accuracy, precision required to measure many biomarkers of interest. New self-calibrating ca capabilities will more quickly and accurately establish individual user baselines, thereby allowing better personalization with increased precision and accuracy. In particular, something like uh, biomarker normalization you know, that the, the levels in bodily fluids like sweat may not be the same. In fact, often aren't identical to what's in blood. So we have to account for that. These capabilities include the ability to carefully meter very small volumes of biofluids, such as sweat. For instance, there's a, a significant interest now in what's called passive sweat, which is uh, not, you know, when you're actively exercising, but just we do exude a small amount of this passive sweat, but not much. So you got to be able to look at on the order of one microliter or less accurately. Also, saliva, tears, wound exudate, uh, for instance, post-surgery. The use of more sensitive measurement techniques, such as an electrochemical detection modality uh, and the ability to monitor and report in real time important personal physiological metrics, such as pH, salt levels, skin temperature, etc., as well as a growing list of other target analytes, including hormones and electrolytes, drugs, neuropeptides, host markers such as cytokines and a host of other biomolecules. We're gonna come back to talk about the value of continuous monitoring. It's amazing how much is going on, but much more is being done than is going to be practical. And one of the things that we're looking at is in fact, where are these advancements gonna be the most useful in both health and in medical care? Great points, Mickey, great points. Also, we cannot forget the rapid advancements in the use of non-invasive sampling techniques, as you mentioned, such as sweat monitoring and newer transdermal collection techniques. For example, Abbott's been quite successful with their Freestyle Libre Glucose Monitor and are now launching new upgraded versions, such as their Lingo Meter. These technologies have helped to revolutionize glucose control for diabetics and are finding increased adoption in uh, other lifestyle uses, such as nutrition and weight loss. Yeah, there was a fascinating book recently by Peter Adia called Outlive, where he specifically talked about the advantage of having continuous glucose monitoring and just understanding your diet habits. You know, when are you spiking your glucose? When are you not? And how important that is in just maintaining your health, not, not because you're diabetic, but because you want to remain healthy. How well established is that becoming, Mickey? I mean, is that becoming a more accepted means of understanding, you know, yourself? 
I truly believe so, because mm -hmm. I think that's one of the major drivers for both Dexcom and Abbott to get OTC claims for their products, for the CGM. They want to expand beyond the diabetic community where those things are so well accepted now. Now it's the, the healthy person trying to maintain their health. Uh, you know, and they're not claimed for pre-diabetics either. Pre-diabetes is on the path. So you should be looking at that uh, on an ongoing basis just to maintain your your overall metabolic health. That's very interesting, Mickey. So we're on the cusp of these technologies being truly applied uh, in, in the consumer side of health and wellness. Yeah. You know, we've worried so much about this issue of regulated versus non-regulated. And we were thinking... Maybe some of these people are going to have opportunities in OTC first with sweat monitors that will later become medicalized and therefore need to go through the FDA. But I don't know about you, but I'm really surprised it's gone the other way. You know, we start out with these regular things now that are, are going to be permitted to be OTC. That's just amazing. Yeah, that's fascinating. Good points. So in addition to these technical uh, improvements that we're seeing now for collecting uh, non-invasive samples and... Uh, the technology for looking at particular biomarkers, we have a significant part of the implementation of these new assays that are not going to be possible without improved usability and wearability enabled by the development of new materials and human factor designs. You know, for instance, we're seeing more and more smart clothing, um, rings, non-skin tear patches for the elderly and, and, or infants. You know, infants' skin is so much thinner than an adult's. You can't use a typical Band-Aid on them. Built-in hydration monitors and, and a lot more. But one other area that's traditionally held back advancement in wearable space has been the need for bulky power sources to run the devices and critically communicate the data to the receiving device. Enhanced battery life enabled by new sources of power, such as body heat and electrical charges and the materials advancements we've mentioned are all working together to support extended wear times, including continuous monitoring applications, improved wearability, lower cost, you know, some of these initial uh, continuous glucose monitors started out where you had to change the battery fairly often. Now they're getting longer and longer to a week or more. Just today, I saw an article in Advanced Materials about a new way of making uh, advanced polymers that have both conductivity as well as the ability to, um, to sample uh, sweat, for instance, where it's a self-assembling material that's a liquid metal combined with an advanced polymer called uh, P dot PSS, uh, and then hydrophilic urethane, where they mix this together and it just takes the form of the bottom being very soft and pliable, uh, but also conductive, and the top being very hydrophilic and non-conductive, all self-assembled. I mean, that's just amazing. This is a group from Penn State University. Wow. Wow, fantastic. Mickey, I've been looking a little eh, half-heartedly into um, electronic fences for our dog so she can actually wander a bit more, more broadly. But I tell you, as soon as the fox goes by, she's gone anyway. But, you know, <laughs> it occurs to me, yeah, I was looking them up and the battery life for the ones that are GPS empowered, you, these can run 10,000 acres. So you can allow your, you know, your pet to wander all around and you have to map it with the GPS and then it sets up the, the virtual mm -hmm. fence. But the battery life is less than a day, and it takes three hours to charge the collar again. So what is the point of that, as opposed yeah. to having more of a traditional you know, electric fence where it can last days and days and days? But I'm right. wondering if this is an interesting possible example towards the end here. Are there Could you build into a dog's collar uh, stress monitors, right, that are transdermal, and you, you know when the dog is starting to get anxious, and could that be a better way to help control you know, the perimeter, the, the, the fencing? I'm That's just, really interesting. Cortisol, like cortisol, we see exactly. people using for humans. Canine yeah, cortisol. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it could also be zoo animals that are stressed out. They're not being cared for properly. That uh, that could be a, a general application. That's very yeah. interesting. And you know, at the same time, none of these new wearables technologies would see much of a market opportunity if they were not able to be developed and manufactured at low cost and in high volumes. Improved manufacturability of new materials and designs helping to drive down development and manufacturing costs, improve functionality and utility, and even improved wearability. These are all on the horizon now. There are new materials, including LIG-based substrates, that's laser-induced graphene, and LEG, laser-enhanced graphene, uh, that are certainly furthering those parameters. 
Yeah, it, it's those are pretty interesting materials too. Where you know they put a, a plastic tri layer down, and then using a laser, it actually forms graphene on the surface. And it's so simple. It uses uh, uh, 3D printing technologies and existing lasers, and it's just amazing. Yeah, it greatly facilitates the development process uh, in smaller, innovative laboratories. Fantastic developments. So that was a nice recap, Rich, of the recent advancements in wearable technologies. You know, and I think these new technologies are helping to bridge the gap between the utility of traditional diagnostics, which are basically taking a sample, you know, every week, every two weeks, every year, and now combining with the ease of use commonly expected with consumer electronics and are thereby helping to address the unmet testing needs of diverse and even new target user groups, such as, we talk about this a lot, elderly and frail health and wellness, and, and people that can't necessarily take care of themselves very well, and, and using these devices to help understand hydration level, hydration being one of the major reasons that the elderly are admitted to the hospital, electrolytes, stress, inflammation, cough, you know, we're seeing a lot of work now understanding the so-called quantitative cough, which we did another podcast on, and being able to diagnose everything from potential TB infection to possibly COVID um, and even lung cancer. And, and UTI in the elderly, which is a much bigger problem than I think a lot of people realize, and much easier than to collect things like sweat versus blood, totally non-invasive. That's true, Mickey. In addition to those opportunities in elder care, we, of course, have the entire women's health space where, you know, frankly, some of the very first point of care diagnostics were launched with uh, pregnancy testing. But the opportunities are expanding rapidly beyond that. Um, so in addition to family planning, we also have the ability to uh, do hormone monitoring for stress and cognitive function uh, to monitor for menopause and, and stage of the reproductive health um, using sweat and other easy to collect biospecimens. And within the women's health space, examples of markers that can be measured now are cortisol, estradiol, progesterone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and many others. Moving beyond women's health, there are also exciting new opportunities in the enhanced performance and fitness monitoring space, including, as Mickey mentioned already, hydration. And some studies that have come out that as low as 1% or 2% change in your hydration status can have measurable and quite meaningful impact on your uh, physical performance capabilities. There's also the ability to much more accurately measure electrolytes, such as sodium, potassium, and incorporate, importantly, self-calibration capabilities that help to allow the improved precision and accuracy to improve the actionability of those results at an individual level. In this space, we're looking, for example, at electrolytes, hydration levels, CRP, procalcitonin, cytokines, and other markers of inflammation. For instance, in electrolytes, potassium is a very important one. And it's one of the early indications of kidney disease. So, you know, people have talked about possibly being able to do constant monitoring of potassium as a measure of that. And oftentimes, you know, people with uh, advanced kidney disease are diagnosed so late, it's, it's nearly irreversible. So uh, that would be uh, very valuable. Cytokines, you know, we've speculated about the possibility that monitoring cytokines on an ongoing basis in someone with flu could, in fact, indicate potential cytokine storm down the road. And would you now then treat that person very differently? And other digital health applications in individuals with other respiratory illnesses, such as COPD or asthma, for instance, detection or monitoring of the host response markers in sweat looking for cytokines, immunoglobulins, soluble proteins, or the use of cell phone apps for cough monitoring. All those things become possible with these wearable uh, technologies like this. Um, there's a great need in, for instance, asthma. Uh, we've looked at this in the, in the past and, you know, can you anticipate a severe asthma attack in severe asthmatics? Because there is a great need for that. So you can deal with it very quickly. And we just don't have the right tools for that today. Yep, having the ability to monitor for a potential pending severe as asthma attack will help keep people out of the ER or perhaps have them move to a different location with less smog or pollution or move indoors or something. All great points. Yeah, it's amazing that, that we found that uh, the amount of money spent on asthma per year in the United States is quite comparable to all cancers combined. That's astonishing. That surely is.
We talked briefly before about the, the issue of, I guess what you would call static uh, testing, where you look at it over a period of time, maybe day one, day seven, day 30, a year from now. And that gives you a very different picture than continuous monitoring, uh, where you could see spikes, you could see changes that might have occurred between those two static points in the past, but you'd never know about it. Now, we, we have an example where we can look at that continuous behavior without measuring continuously, and that's hemoglobin A1C, which gives us sort of an average glucose understanding over about a 90-day period. But again, within that, we don't see the, the spiking. The only way we see that is with continuous glucose monitoring. And there have been some surprises that people have, have uh, noted when they did continuously monitor something that they never really looked at before. I remember one, Rich, talking with some of our friends at the Gates Foundation, where there had been a study on baseball pitchers looking at their pulse rate, and they found that they were getting up around 180 to 200 pulses per minute while they were pitching. And people were just blown right. away that that could be. No one would ever have seen that unless they had been continuously monitoring it. I also remembered one of our old friends that was at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that had done a study with people at Emory University looking at the change in heart rate in individuals that uh, were in the hospital. And they found that the, the most significant morbidity and mortality occurred in people that had a more significant change in their heart rate over the course of their stay. So that the, you know, they were looking at that as a way to alert the medical staff, you need to be much more careful with this individual. But who would have guessed that, you know? So I just suspect that as we start looking at things like cortisol levels, cytokine levels, whatever else on a continuous basis, we're going to learn things that we have no understanding of today. Uh, and it'll just open up doors that we can't imagine. Yeah, wonderful examples there, Mickey. You know, and with all this in mind, there are several other points, you know, not really technology driven points to consider when thinking about uh, entering into the wearable space. For example, and we mentioned this briefly earlier, it's critical to understand what defines a regulated medical device versus a non regulated consumer application and the occasional movement from one of these segments to the other, from regulated to unregulated or vice versa. Questions about who is requesting the data who is obtaining the data, and how the data is being recorded and used are all instrumental in determining whether a new wearable device may be considered a medical device. These distinctions become important when considering new potential application areas, perhaps such as providing safety net alternatives for underserved rural and urban populations without traditional or appropriate access to necessary diagnostics and even supporting self-testing in telehealth applications, for example, remote mental health monitoring, remote monitoring for chronic diseases such as kidney and cardiovascular disease, respiratory conditions such as asthma and COPD, and remote monitoring for discharged hospital patients and others. And of course, we already have examples of this, uh, let's call it a conundrum. You know, thermometers, oximeters, glucometers, whether those are being used in the home, purchased at a local drugstore and used by the individual, uh, again, in their home, or used by a medical practitioner in the hospital, those are different devices. In the latter case, FDA regulates them and they go through a uh, clearance process. Um, and in the former case, those are devices that are considered consumer devices. So even though they're used for the same end result, who is collecting that data and how that data is being utilized? Is the doctor requesting it, even though the patient is collecting it themselves, or is it just for the patient's uh, own edification? Those are all critical in, in helping determine that definition. Right. I mean, for instance, if we had a concerning oximeter reading during the COVID pandemic, we couldn't do anything specifically other than go to the clinic to be seen. What's the first thing they're going to do there? They're going to check that. And then they'll make their medical decision. Correct. Yeah. Why don't we just take this a little bit further? So many of the people we've talked to that are developing wearable devices are, are not really aware of this rather clean distinction between regulated and non-regulated. They often want to be in a non-regulated environment. That, that makes sense. But what does that mean? It, it, it really just means that you don't want the healthcare professional using it to make a decision about what they're going to do with the patient. Otherwise, that will go through the FDA. Mm -hmm. And that's always going to be an issue anyhow, because 
FDA is going to look at these things and say, well, maybe that's going to drift over into that professional use. And therefore, I do want to see this device. You know, the, the, the recent fact that uh, some of these cleared continuous glucose monitors have become OTC suggests that they're becoming pretty clear about the distinction of, of the use of these devices in different environments and getting more comfortable with it. And that's good. That's a really, really good thing. Yes. For, for example, Mickey, at least as things stand today, in the elder care environment, if one is interested in remotely um, helping to, to track or, or watch the blood pressure, the hydration status of a loved one that's in one of these facilities, that's something a family member could decide on their own purchase one of these devices and figure out through a smartphone or through another way to, you know, just do a little bit of remote checking in. Uh, but as soon as that information then is being used by perhaps the uh, nurse practitioner to decide whether or not to transport that individual, you know, for medical care, then it becomes a medical device. Um, and so that, that's an area that's probably going to evolve here over the next couple of years. Uh, that's how things are today. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. As the value of this new information like continuous monitoring, becomes more and more clear. I think, you know, the agency is going to have no choice but then to look at these things and understand ramifications of them. But the benefits will be so great that we just have to find a way through it. Yeah, excellent point. This episode of Halteris Presents is brought to you by the UC San Diego Extended Studies In Vitro Diagnostics Product Development Course. Are you looking to take your biotech career to the next level? The UC San Diego Extended Studies In Vitro Diagnostics Product Development course is a unique live online program designed for managers, entrepreneurs, investors, and scientists. This team taught course by award winning industry experts covers everything there is to know about the requirements for moving an IVD product from concept to regulatory approval and market launch. Explore real-world product development cases to help you plan for success by covering topics such as setting product requirements and specifications to meet customer needs, critical path management, resource planning, principles of assay development, instrumentation, role and composition of the product development team, risk analysis, and IVD clinical and regulatory issues such as compliance and complaint handling. Ready to get started? Enroll today and use our exclusive discount code to get a 10% discount on your enrollment. Use code HALTERES10 at checkout. That's H-A-L-T-E-R-E-S-10 for 10% off the price of your UC San Diego Extended Studies In Vitro Diagnostics Product Development Course. Just check the link in the show notes for this episode and use code HALTERES10 to enroll today. Accelerate your In Vitro Diagnostics career with the UC San Diego Extended Studies Program. Your future in biotech starts here. You know, we're talking mostly about human health, but we got to realize that there's a lot beyond that. For instance, in companion animals, um, we all recognize that they're not a lot different from humans. Cats get diabetes. Cats get cardiovascular disease. Dogs get cancer. You know, all these things are things that the same technology can be used for um, in those animals monitored by vets or by the human or by care providers. So those are all open opportunities. Herd animals, where we've seen recently the issues with H5N1 in milk cows, you actually could in some way or another use something to, to monitor that occurring within a herd. You might not have to, to put the wearable on every single cow, but you might in fact be able to put it on a sentinel number of them that would be representative of the, of the entire herd. Maybe it's also just a sound that they make and you can monitor their their uh, their mooing <laughs> or whatever it is as an indication of, of this, which you will learn by monitoring things like that within a herd if they become infected. Now, all these things, you know, are, are very doable with devices that we're using now to, to deal with human health. We also have the concern in the cows with H5N1 of it spilling over into humans. This whole issue of spillover that we addressed with our podcast with David Quammen in his book on spillover, which is just a fascinating topic and one that we're constantly dealing with. So there are lots of activities trying to understand whether diseases in reservoir animals are going to spill over into humans. So because we know that coronaviruses have spilled over in humans from bats in the past, there's been a concern about that on a continuous basis. What could you do? Well, 
you know, it, it's it's common for biologists to tag bats to look at their migrations. And many bats have very oddball migrations. They don't go to the same place every year. They don't go to the same time every year. And uh, bats carry rabies. Bats carry coronaviruses. And it it you can imagine it might be helpful to actually monitor the movement of bats that you know to be carriers. So I'm not aware that people are doing it for that purpose, but you could do it. Another application of wearables. As an aside, Mickey, is it safe to add Ebola to your list? Is there still speculation? We don't know, to my knowledge, where the reservoir for Ebola is. People have been looking at this for quite some time, but I'm not aware that, uh, that anyone knows. It's amazing in this day and age. It is. It is. You know, we've talked a bit about things that can be monitored, one of which you mentioned during the discussion about women's health, which is cortisol. And that is, of course, associated with stress. It's interesting to think about the potential applications of stress monitoring beyond simply people that you know to have a problem with cortisol levels. But for instance, mental health, could, could cortisol monitoring become a monitor of the effectiveness of therapy? You know, it's very interesting, Mickey, that you bring that example up. Several years ago in one of the Gates Foundation uh, convenings we were at, um, I believe it was a researcher at McGill University mentioning that mental health and mental health related conditions are the largest remaining undiagnosed and unappropriately uh, treated conditions on the planet right now. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more focus on that, but how do you measure it effectively? I mean, there are questionnaires and a number of things like that, but could you actually monitor the biological response to stress as a measure of effectiveness? That's a good question. You know, it's interesting when we talk about women's health, um, one of the things, of course, that's been occurring is later and later women getting pregnant. So that, of course, brings with it challenges with uh, fertility, as well as challenges, you know, just maintaining a healthy pregnancy throughout the entire uh, gestational period. There's certainly an application area for wearables um, and, and, and helping to monitor throughout that entire progression, if you will, during the pregnancy, including, you know, trying to become pregnant in the whole fertility cycle. And of course, all the way through menopause. Uh, so it's the entire, you know, hormone cycle of the woman's life that can be very effectively monitored now with these new high sensitive and, and precise uh, wearables. Yeah, I mean, you know, get a much more precise understanding of the, the right moment for conception uh, by, by understanding exactly the status. That would be quite helpful, I would imagine. Well, Preeclampsia markers, you know, are you, yeah. you know, body temperature, if nothing else, is is an indicator. Gestational diabetes, but we don't have any particularly good way. Well, no, that's an interesting one. I wonder about CGM in the pregnancy. I, I'm just not aware of this, but you would think that that would be a particularly good way of monitoring for gestational diabetes because the the change in glucose levels happens rapidly, and on with the cust, you know, the, the normal infrequent testing that goes on, you often see it well after it's already happened. So being able to know it's happened now and dealing with it more quickly would be very valuable. You know, it's interesting, Mickey. I wonder if companies like Unilever or uh, Procter & Gamble are considering adapting wearables even for uh, pregnancy testing. You know, if you're already continuously monitoring for hormone levels uh, to determine the best time, right, for uh, fertility, you know, it ought to be a pretty good pregnancy test as well, um, and potentially another market application. That is interesting. <laughs> I still think that and elder care are the two most exciting segments. Yeah, absolutely. At the moment. Well, it, it's just amazing how much is going on in wearables and, and how much it has the potential to impact our health and um, the health of our loved ones. It, it's just, we're going to learn so much because these technologies become available to monitor things continuously that we never monitored very well in the past at all. So I just look forward to seeing what happens. Likewise, Mickey. Exciting time for diagnostics. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of How Terrorist Presents. This is Rich Thayer. And Mickey Yerday. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. 
Holteras Presents is produced by Holteras Associates, a U.S.-based bioscience consultancy that provides strategic and tactical services in the areas of diagnostics, medical devices, and life science research to clients of all sizes. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the episode are solely those of the individuals involved, and Holteras Associates is not responsible for any errors or omissions or for the results obtained from the use of this information. The information provided in this episode is for informational or educational purposes only and is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Holteras Associates would like to say thank you to this episode's guests or guests and thank you for listening to this episode of Holteras Presents. Thank you.